Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, we're a webcast, we're an online show, we're a, what's this thing? No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where we cover anything, um, variety of topics and activities, anything of interest to libraries. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch. Both our live sessions that we do here every ten, uh, ten, every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. <laughs> And our recorded sessions, which are all posted onto our website, they're posted up to our YouTube account, along with any presentations and links, everything is all there for you afterwards. So you can watch the live show with us on Wednesdays, or uh, go on our website and see the recordings of all of our shows. Um, and we do a mixture of things here, presentations, mini training sessions, book review sessions, um, like I said, anything library related, um, we can have it on the show. And we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, and we sometimes bring in guest speakers. Um, and today we have a mixture of that. Uh, once a month we have a tech talk with Michael Sowers. Michael is the technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Hello, Good Michael. morning, Krista. And once a month he comes on and does something definitely techie related. Um, we sometimes have techie shows other times in the month, but definitely every the last Wednesday one every month. month will be um, something like that. Um, and he pretty much always brings on um, someone to interview, talk with, to do a presentation. Yeah. And that's what he's got for us today. So I'm just going to hand over to you, Michael, to... Uh, tell us what we've had for this morning. All right. Thanks a lot, Krista. Uh, as she said, I'm Michael Sowers, the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Commission. And a um, little, little background to this one is uh, back in the um, mid-90s after I got my library degree, I actually lived in Las Vegas for a couple of years. And going there, got to go to the Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, which is just is an amazing experience. I actually got to hear Bill Gates give a keynote uh, uh, one year there. Um, don't get to go anymore. Really would like to, but Brian Pitchman, uh, my good friend from the Evolve Project, uh, went last year and gave us kind of a report back of, of what happened, and uh, I welcome him back this year uh, because he went to the 2015 Consumer Electronics Show. Good morning, Brian. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me back. And uh, so, Brian, uh, what would you find and what do we want to know about? Yeah, so I'll kind of just do a brief overview of what the CES is first. So CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, um, it's a hodgepodge of new products, product announcements. A lot of people are showing off their latest and greatest technology. Um, even so, even their, where you can actually play with it, too, which is really cool. So you get, you get a hands-on experience before everybody else. So you get gloating rights, I suppose, when you attend. Um, it runs the first full week of January. Uh, so this year was actually it's Sunday, the 4th, the Friday, the 9th. Uh, and exhibits open Tuesday, the 6th. So there's Sunday and Monday are usually like more press days. So there's a whole bunch of like the large companies like Sony. They'll do a huge release of what's coming out. Or uh, Intel will talk about their new microprocessors and their new PCs that they're coming out with. Um, and then the exhibit itself, where all the booths are, uh, that's for the remainder of the week. But throughout the, the latter part of the week, there's still a lot of events and press-related uh, announcements. So CES is one of the largest events of its kind. There was 3,600 exhibitors this year, and it brought in about 170,000 industry professionals uh, for a two in a 2.2 million square feet arena. Um, and it spanned across two different centers. There was a uh, convention Center in Vegas, and then also the Venetian in Vegas. Um, and this image below is an example of one of the booths. They go from very simple, like here's your 9x9 nine nine space, to uh, an interactive exhibit. So what this exhibit was showing, when you walk up to it, there's a little camera, and then it shows up uh, phrases to you. It was kind of neat. So 2.2 million square feet, if you want to envision it, equals roughly 38 football fields. Uh, so extremely large and a lot of walking. Um, so here's, an here's some of the examples of the grandeur of the booths. I actually am really impressed by the booth a lot more uh, than some of the technology that I saw. Um, so I was like, wow, like, so Intel's booth, just hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars were spent on their ginormous booth with these little pods that change color throughout the day. Uh, some booths actually had two stories. So if you had uh, like a VIP pass, if you will, Oculus had some one-on-one -on -one press rooms um, where you can like have a one-on-one -on -one combo with one of the engineers in Oculus and play with it. Um, 
And then you had your simple, you know, traditional style boots that we're all used to seeing. Um, Belkin had a, a, a ginormous booth as well with all of their uh, home automation stuff. And I'm going to go break down into some of the trends at CES in a little bit. This is cool. Uh, Philips had a history of, of all the remotes they've ever made along the wall. Like, as people were walking past, they're like, oh, I was looking for this remote. I should just try to yank it off the wall. It's like a joke. Um, so, yeah, it was actually really, really neat. Audi, so as you get as larger and more well-funded companies, if you will, uh, they had larger and greater boots. So Audi had this, I just thought it looked really neat. They had a white floor and they made white panels. So when you're standing in the room, um, it looked like you were in an entirely white box. Panasonic's booth is from this point all the way down there, so huge. Some of these exhibits are ex expansively large. So what does it take to attend CES? So if you were to attend on Monday to Saturday, and I encourage you staying till Saturday because there's events every night um, for networking purposes. So, and I'll get a little bit into that in a little bit. So cost-wise, uh, hotels are anywhere from 150 to 250 a night. Uh, the flight anywhere from 200 to 400 bucks. And food, I actually only spent about 100 dollars on food uh, because I basically wait until the evening events because there's a lot of parties and VIP events that you can attend to. And by VIP, I mean you send an email to somebody in marketing, I assume, and then they send you back like this phrase word um, you use. So there's no real, I don't know, smoke and mirrors to be a VIP member to go to any of these VIP events. Um, it's like you find the email address, you say, hey, can I go? And like, it looks like everyone is approved. Um, so just starve yourself until you get to one of those free little uh, food parties, and then you'll be fine. Um, so transportation to and from your hotel and the conference center, it's a free shuttle. But from airport to your hotel, there's like this $14 round trip shuttle pass you can buy, um, which is fairly cheap. The ticket to get in to CES is free if you register early. Um, and in order to be part of CES, you have to be uh, either an industry expert, so have some of an affiliation with the tech industry, uh, press, if you want to be a press member, you have to have like a, uh, an actual newsletter or e-newsletter e uh, publication with like history of doing it. Uh, but to be honest with you, if you wanted to attend as an industry expert or industry analyst, you can use your library business card if you are in the technology field. And even not, you can just ask and your supervisor, hey, can I make a business card that says, um, you know, I'm going to go to CES for technology-related things, or I'm in the makerspace. Can I, like, improve my business card to kind of highlight that? Um, and it's really simple. You scan your business card in. They look, they look it over in, I don't know, half a second. And if it looks like it's tech-orientated and you add value to attending, they'll let you go for free. So I encourage you to register early. And then kind of decide, like, financially, does the rest of the cost make sense to you? Um, and if you didn't want to take the free shuttle to and from the hotels, it's like 7 to 15 bucks a uh, taxi ride. What to bring to CES? Um, you want to bring a really good camera. Um, so the photos I took was a uh, Samsung NX300 camera and plenty of memory cards. Uh, a power brick for your phone. Uh, because your phone battery, because you're, you're in a small space, if you will, with a whole bunch of other people connecting to their cell phone providers, there's a lot of interference. So your battery drains quicker. So what I would tell you to do, because my battery probably died halfway through the day, um, buy one of those power bricks, 20, 30 bucks now, so that way you'll have power all day long. Bring really good shoes. I made the mistake last year of just wearing dress shoes, thinking that would have been good enough, and I destroyed those as well as my feet. So I'd highly encourage you to buy, I actually wore gym shoes um, with like those gel inserts this year. Uh, attire, what do people wear? It ranges from like jeans and like band t-shirts if you will or uh, like oh I love Sony heart type of t-shirt. Uh, people wearing full suits. So what I would encourage you to do depending on what your goal at CES, um, dress business casual. I wore like real nice jeans, a dress shirt and a sports jacket. Um, when I was at CES I had a very specific mission in mind. I'm going to get to that. So why do you want to attend CES? Uh, first and foremost, you get a chance to experience all the latest and greatest in terms of technology. 
you're going to see what's out on the market before it's out on the market. Um, and that's really good knowledge to have because when you are talking to, for instance, your patrons, and they're like, hey, let's talk about tablets, or, you know, I'm thinking of buying a new computer, or, or anything along those lines, you can have an informed conversation about what you're aware of um, because we're, we, we're supposed to know all these things, right? Um, you also get the chance to meet founders, creators, leads of marketing, leads of development um, for all these different companies, which is really a unique uh, perspective because it gives you a chance to talk to them about libraries. So why do I attend CES? Is I find companies that are doing something that's really awesome and really interactive or engaging uh, and invite them to work with libraries. Um, and so I'll point out some of the companies as we go through. Uh, but hey, I, I like your product. Have you considered beta testing in the library? And they're all like, oh, that's a great idea. We haven't thought about that. Yeah, let's do it. And there's no other environment that I can think of that allows the librarian to kind of control those conversations. And CES allows you to do that. You can also invite some of the companies there to share their expertise, whether it be starting a business or um, getting crowdsourced funded or anything like that in your library. So have conversations with, I've been having conversations with these exhibitors at CES specifically about how can you help me improve libraries. Um, more versus the whole, hey, here's all the really cool technology. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of really good reasons to attend. And so I take this bit of information with me as well. So I'm, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with uh, the Pew Research Center. So they did, they did this survey where they asked a variety of individuals, how often have you used the library in the last 12 months, and how important is your library to the community? 53% say, I've used in the last 12 months, but 91 says, it's very important. So there's a 38% gap. I, since I am approaching exhibitors, uh, my potential of succeeding is extremely high. I have a 91% success rate of talking to someone that wants to help libraries based off the, the chart. So with that in mind, I know that I can speak to 1,900 exhibitors that have used the library in the last 12 months and almost 3,300 exhibitors feel libraries are important. So the cost of me to attend to reach that many groups of people is phenomenal um, from a price standpoint. So if you have that same attitude and you wanted to bring companies into your library space, you have 3,300 people you can talk to, um, if you will. So when I spoke to these companies, what kind of questions and what kind of trends should you, should you ask if you attend? So I'll ask, hey, have you considered libraries? What is your marketing strategy to libraries? Do you value libraries? Um, so like, do you think libraries are important? Yes, you do. Awesome. Well, we're doing stuff about maker spaces, and I see you have a really great 3D printer. Would you be willing to let my library uh, showcase it for a month or a week or a year? Which could tie into, would you let my library beta test your product? And surprisingly, the buy-in to do this type of stuff is extremely high. Um, companies are always willing to have an opportunity to showcase and then also have that good, hey, look, I helped the library out feeling. So more about the conference. So there's two main venues, the Convention Center and the Venetian. Uh, the Convention Center is where most of the mainstream exhibits are, like the large brand name companies like Samsung, LG. It's extremely crowded. Like you are elbow to elbow the entire time as you wade through the mass of people. Um, and they have some of the most expensive and extremely elaborate displays. Those slides I showed you at the beginning were all from the Convention Center, all massive displays. The Venetian, which is my favorite portion, um, there's a section called Eureka Park. There's lots of hands-on demos, and a lot of startup companies are there. So there's a lot of companies trying to get their feet off the ground, and they're showing off their product, even giving it away to some other people, but hey, play with this, let me know what you think. Uh, last year, Eureka Park was kind of like a secret. Like Not many people knew about it, and I loved it because it was like a smaller group of people went there. This year, they moved all the 3D printers into Eureka Park, which caused all the 3D printing uh, enthusiasts to crowd up my uh, usually almost empty startup space. So there's some, there were some major trends at CES, and we'll kind of break it through uh, each one. So 3D printing, uh, which was in the Venetian, a lot of 3D printing companies. And I would point out that if you see a printer for $3,200 or $2,700, there's probably something that makes a 3D printer just like that now for $1,000, uh, for $500. So 
it's really interesting to see how expensive 3D printers initially were and how everyone bought it right away. But now people are making better improved models on their own, often from open source uh, perspectives that print even better for a fraction of the cost. Uh, so this one company called 3DP Unlimited has a giant, uh, I think it's three feet by three feet print bed. Um, so you can print out like really large objects. I think the cost was uh, like 20000 That was pretty expensive. Um, there was one exhibit space that lets you scan yourself and print yourself on top of an action figure, um, which was really neat. Their line was extremely long. And I wanted to do it, but I didn't really want to wait in the line. Uh, another company called See Me CNC has a really unique printer, and I just thought it was was really cool because instead of having the X Y axis moving up, it's three it's three poles, and the uh, the print head bounces back and forth between all three. I thought that was really just a different way to print, and that printer is about a thousand. Um, the first ever, I believe it's the first ever dot matrix 3D printer. So this printer prints very similar to how a laser jet printer prints. Um, so it shoots little pieces of ink out. Whereas in the 3D printer world, it shoots plastic out. So you know, the quality you get is far better than you get from your traditional flatbed um, type of printing. So here, this is an object, no sanding, no solution. Like That's how it looks like fresh off the printer. And I thought that was phenomenally well detailed. There is a 3D printer that converts paper into 3D objects. So you can buy a ream of paper and print out the 3D using paper. Their machine was about 20 grand, I believe, as well. Uh, 3 Doodler. Um, they had a pen came out last year that was relatively large, um, but it, it was a good entryway into 3D designing. Now they refocused their design, and I was able to play with it, um, in the little glass showcase that you see on the left, there's a pen. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's much smaller. It's about the size of a like a highlighter, and you can. There's a battery pack in there as well, so you can 3D print just by drawing without having to plug in, which I thought was really neat. So drones. I've never been a huge fan of drones. Um, I don't know. They just never amazed me, but a lot of people that I was able to fly them, so that made it fun. Um, so all sorts of different drones from different cost sizes. Uh, here's a drone here. Uh, there's another drone with a little camera on the actual controller. They had cages built where you can like fly your drones with other people's drones, and that was pretty neat. Um, super strong and powerful drones that can lift heavy objects. It also says no photography. I messed up there. Uh, micro drones. So they have mini little drones that you can fly around now that fit in the palm of your hand. Uh, I guess to chase your favorite pets around the house. Um, you can have your own drones designed now, any color you want. So drones were drones are huge. A lot of people like them. People are. I have a friend that's an engineer that uses drones to survey buildings uh, for structural deficiencies. And so there's a lot of value using it. I just don't have one, so I was I pass through it. Home automation. Um, home automation is starting to become extremely big. Everyone wants to be part of it. Every, there's, there was hundreds of companies that like came out with their own home automation tools. The downside with home automation is if everyone's building their own type of interconnected devices, sometimes they don't cross-pollinate. So you'll buy brand A to open your garage door and tell you when someone opens your house door but it doesn't talk with brand B, which controls all your outlets. They use similar technologies like Z-Wave. However, no one has really made a hub or a device that lets all these home automation things connect together. So what you're stuck with is multiple companies and multiple apps on your phone to control, which is kind of disappointing. But there's new companies out there that are trying to basically build a whole suite of things. Anything that you can automate, they're going to build, which costs a ton. Um, so Exhibit-wise, Iris probably had the neatest booth set up where they built a house as their, in their exhibit space. Literally a house with two floors that you can walk through and interact with various home automated things like lights turning on automatically, 
doors opening once you uh, it recognizes your face. Web cameras. Garage, they even had a garage door opener in there to show you how it works. Now you can remotely control it. So the whole the whole house was automated, which was really really cool. Made me wish I had a ton of money so I could do it myself. Here is Belkin. Um, so they have a Wemo. Most of it is just plug and play. Um, you plug it into an outlet, you connect it to your phone, and you're good to go. Um, but you can control all these things from your phone now. Um, other companies, so like Smart Home, I've never heard of before, but they have a suite of products that interconnect and let you manage your house remotely. Uh, Boy at, or Bay at Home was another company that even had uh, coffee pot, cr uh, crock pots, um, where you can like turn them on remotely and program them, program when you want things to turn on and when what happens. Uh, just lots of different companies that are now getting into that space. You have from home security, people don't have to buy a thousand cameras anymore with all these sensors to protect their house. Companies like Zapato uh, make a small device. Uh, Canary was one of the first ones that I saw at CES last year. This one's even smaller. There's like a series of cameras on there, sensors on there. It even detects your air quality and makes sure that everyone in the home is safe and comfortable. They even have sprinklers now that are automated and they they sync up with whether it's rained or not. So if you were if your subdivision says, hey, you can only water on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, the sprinkler, you would tell the that to the sprinkler, and then the, if it rained on Monday, you don't have to sprinkle on Tuesday, and it would know that and not bother turning itself on. Uh, droplet actually like points and shoots where water needs to be, which I thought was really, really cool. So in this scenario, if you had a pot here and a pot here and you didn't want the grass to get wet, it would like identify it and shoot the water at it. Samsung, you can diagnose your washers and dryers now all from your phone. You can get a text alert when your laundry's ready. So if it's on a different floor, you don't have to worry about it, I suppose. But all these devices now are connecting to the Internet, which is what people call the Internet of Things. Um, so this home automation was extremely popular at CES. They even have robots that clean windows. Um, and I wanted to find out what happens if there's a power outage. Does the robot just fall off the window? Because that would suck. Uh, but I wasn't allowed to test it in a plug. I asked if I could, and they said no. I'm assuming it just loses all suction and falls. But, neat idea. They even have robots to clean your grills, for Pete's sake. So, basically, anything that you used to have to do and didn't want to do, remember when our parents were like, ah, oh, you know, when you get older, you'll have to clean your own house? You could tell them, well, not anymore. I can have a robot do basically everything and then automate everything that fix itself, which makes me happy. Uh, they even have jars that detect what kind of, you would tell it what kind of foods in the jar, and then using an app, it can tell you what you can make today based off of what you told was in each jar. And it, there's like a weight sensor in there and it can figure out how much things you can make, what you need to buy, uh, and it even gives you an alert if something's about to spoil. So uh, perishable items, you would tell, hey, when did you buy it? All right, I'll tell you when it will become stale or uh, unedible. So wearables. Wearables is also pretty huge at CES. Everyone's getting into the wearable business. A company called iHealth basically makes stuff that looks just like um, Fitbits and Jawbones. So there's a lot of, it's called OEM hardware. So a lot of companies now are doing, like they'll take somebody else's design, if you will, and they put all their own hardware and own software into it, but it does the exact same thing uh, for fractions of the cost. Uh, you can have an entire line of healthcare or health workout equipment that can sense and program and learn from your habits to make sure that you are on the correct track for uh, healthy workout attitudes. And props to these people for working out like every day because that's what they had to do for their exhibit. They even have headbands that you can wear. There's a company called Muse that you would, it works like an EKG almost where you do brain exercises and it helps you strengthen your brain, have better memory and things like that. And if that wasn't enough, they even have stuff for babies now. So they have cribs that you can put your baby in and it measures your heart rate monitor, or heart rate, your temperature. And if you didn't like that, they have stickers that you can stick on your child that will 
send you messages if something's wrong with their temperature or if they're stirring in their sleep. All water sleep is gone and all technically a wearable. And if that wasn't crazy enough, there's this thing called O-Cube. And I saw it work. There's little tiny cameras underneath this, this cube. Um, so you pick up the blue part and you put it on your face and it somehow can microscopically see your face detail and analyze it and figure out your true skin pigmentation um, and then give you recommendations how to improve your facial health. So it would recommend um, skincare products. It would recommend like, hey, you need to moisturize. And then it even syncs up with the weather forecast for the day. So if, the, so if it knew that your type of skin is susceptible to um, sunburn, it would say, hey, it's going to be a sunny day today. Put on sunscreen and send you a text alert on your phone, which I thought was, wow, that's really neat. And if that wasn't enough, they even have headband or um, hats you can wear that can monitor uh, head injury. So if you're playing one of those contact sports, you can keep better track of it and make sure that you're not injuring yourself. More with wearables, watches. Everyone is in the watch business. And programmable watches. There was a, uh, I stood in line for 10 minutes to win a, this Martian watch. To, uh, it would sync with your phone and do really cool things. And they were giving them away. And so I'm like, you know what, maybe I'll be lucky today. It is Vegas. i got to gamble somewhere. And so the whole time, no one in front of me was winning. And so I was joking, like, hey, this thing's rigged. No one obviously wins this thing. So the people behind me also lost. We were all joking about it. And then, like, three people after us, three people in a row all won. I was like, oh, I was there at the wrong time. Little blue bump. Even Intel has their own watch now and wearable technology. Um, this looks very similar to the uh, Apple watches that were coming out. So everyone's getting into the business of smart watches. And here's another OEM company. So what else could you wear? If you were construction or working outside, you can wear this vest that will have that has digital displays on the wristbands, so you can see if someone like sent you a message, if you're looking for directions, it would blink automatically at night. There's integrated speakers and headphones, and Bluetooth, so you can take and answer phone calls without you know having to use your hands. They have helmets that you can wear that will blink and let you know when you need to turn or if there's danger. Um, very similar to some of those new cars that have the uh, collision detectors in it. And if that wasn't enough and you're like, all right, my whole family, even my baby is wearing a wearable device, but what about Fido? You can also give your doggy some wearables. Um, so last year there was a few companies that had monitoring tools for your dogs. This year, if you wanted to mount your GoPro to your dog, you finally can, uh, thanks to the modern works of technology. And what I thought was really neat, and I got a, it's a poor photo, so I had to go online. There's this device that you can stand in and have a fully immersive uh, virtual reality gaming experience. So you wear this harness, you stand in this, like, uh, rubberized mat, and you can run in place. And during your game, you can, like, run and shoot and point and have a 360-degree virtual reality experience. And the cost is only 500 bucks. And I was like, not bad. I can replace my living room furniture for that. Um, I don't know how everyone would feel about that when they come over, but I would have fun. And so you only have to buy an Oculus Rift at this point for that fully immersive virtual reality experience. Let's say you're working out and you're like, you know, traditional biking isn't enough for me. Now you can wear an Oculus Rift and bike and your and virtually see you going up a hill when you set the uh, health ride or whatever. So, you know, incline at this point. So you can virtually see all that happening. And they even have yoga mats that uh, the lady on the left is doing, like, stretches and stuff. And on the iPad, or the giant screen on the bottom here, was showing if she had the right posture and doing it correctly. So now that we have completely automated our lives, let's get some more robots in here, right? So somebody made a uh, robot that um, you play beer pong with. Oh, let me play the video. Actually. And so this was really neat. Um, so before I took the video, 
uh, the robot missed. And so it, it somehow recalculates itself and then shoots again. So it's picking up a ball on its, on its own, lining itself up, and it shoots it perfectly. If it missed the first time, it'll, it'll recalibrate and shoot the second time. They had uh, a company called Wemo, uh, or Huawei, sorry. They make uh, all these different types of robots um, that aren't technically programmable yet, but they're working on it. And so there's, for this one, there's a, there's a ball that you can shake and move around and get the dinosaur to interact with you and play with you, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, there's a robot from a company called Spin Masters that dances and moves and interacts and you build it and then you can program it to do different things. Uh, Modular Robotics, they actually won a, an award for one of, I think it was the best toy award uh, at CES and so they have these little cubes that you can uh, link together and build robots from without having to do any soldering or programming or anything like that. If you were into more of the hands-on uh, design and building of things, there's a company called Actobotics that lets you like buy kits and you can build huge robots out of. Another company called Ozobot, which is really new and they're one of the companies that I approached about working with libraries and they were floored by it. They're like, that's a great idea. We'd love to. Let's chat more. So what Ozobot, I think if I'm pronouncing it right, Ozobot does is you can draw lines and the robot will trace and you can play games, learning games, interactive games, and build them just by using different types of lines and patterns. Very neat idea. But what else? So from the mainstream perspective, uh, there was a lot of computers, TVs, audio, and mobility like cases and amplifiers. So Intel came out with all these really small computers. And I think the one in the back right is a gaming computer. So I'm not sure if you're familiar, but remember the Alienware computers or like really large, bulky looking things? This little tiny box has the exact same power, if not better, than those. Um, and also I didn't get to see it at CES, but they have this little Intel, it's like a Chromecast stick almost, that has Windows on it. So you can plug it into a computer, into a TV monitor uh, and have a fully functional, functioning Windows 7, Windows 8 computer right at your fingertips. Lots of phone cases. Just like last year, I think I had like 20 some odd phone cases. This year I actually was like, no, 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 that's okay, as they're handing them out. They're even giving away phone cases with integrated battery this year, which I thought was pretty cool. Lots of audio companies were there um, showing off their audio products. I have, I don't notice audio differences. So to me, like when they're like, hey, our speakers are the best, it's like, I don't know, to be honest with you, they all sound the same. They don't appreciate that. Lots of TVs, high quality 4K, even 8K TVs were being shown. Um, and at that point, like I couldn't even tell the difference. Like I thought, okay, once you get the 4K, it looks pretty real. Um, 8K looks the same to me. But they're also getting super thin. Um, TVs are getting thinner and thinner, like paper thin almost. Here's an example here. And one of the booths, Sony, they had this 360 degree projector inside their booth. I'm going to play it for you guys. I thought that was the, the wildest thing. So 360 degree projector inside their booth showcasing their products. They even had a, uh, they somehow filmed uh, a concert and so it was like you're really there because you see the back of people's heads when you're looking forward and people's faces when you're looking behind you. So wouldn't that be neat to have in the library when you walk in and digitally see all the different sections and, and what's there? I don't know, just thought. Yeah, lots and lots of monitors and TVs. So what were some products that I thought instantly could be worked with in your library space? 
Um, so I know that a lot of libraries have display cases for their iPads or they mount them places for people to have like card catalogs. Uh, they have a company called MacLots. They make their own cases and hardware shells where you can pop in your tablet securely and not have to worry about it. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with uh, document scanners, but there's a company that has their own document scanners now looks like other companies are doing the same thing. Stamp Snap. Uh, Tigley makes these rubberized shapes that you can play with your iPad to learn how to count, spell, do numbers, things like that. There's another company that I forgot to put a picture of. It's called Edwin. It's this Bluetooth rubberized duck that you can put in the water and you can play with it through the app and back and forth and read Edwin's stories and shake Edwin because that's the duck's name and interact with him in a playful way, which I thought was really neat. Touchscreen kiosks have, I remember seeing these things four years ago and they were like six grand. Now you can get a touchscreen table for like 1400 bucks and do interactive uh, designing, drawing, uh, uploading photos and sharing photos with other people. Very, very, very cool. Uh, another app, an app company was there called Communico Tool that will help you uh, with learning with uh, language disorders you can use this app to learn different languages to learn how to speak better and more fluently and it's a free app and I was like wow that's really neat and so now time for the crazy stuff uh, in Samsung's booth they had this or no Panasonic I'm sorry so they had this mirror that you can look at and as you look at it, you can select different facial features you want to see on yourself. All in real time. So as this lady laughed, smiled, moved her head, she was able to add facial hair, change her hair color, um, and it stuck with her as she moved. And I thought that was really, really cool. They had giant TV monitors on robotic arms. And somebody was Skyping, because there's a camera up there, with the audience. I thought it was weird. They had a, there was a lot of massage chair companies there and a lot of mattress companies, um, but people were taking naps on new beds and getting massages on massage chairs. And if that wasn't enough, if you just finished your massage and you're like, you know what, I want to make my teeth a little bit brighter, there was an exhibit for that too. They had a, uh, there's like this mouse that learns gestures. And if you didn't like mice at all, you can stare at a screen and using just your eyes, interact with your computer. So in this exercise, this guy is looking at um, his screen and he has to look at the red dots in order to cross them out and proceed through the, the this is a game, but you can also use your computer without touching anything. Uh, NVIDIA showed off their um, autopilot cars that, they're, that they've been designing. And this car looked really neat and it has a on the glass it has the heads up display so you can see how fast you're going get directions without having to look anywhere else except forward uh, there was an award show so CES does innovation awards and then there's another group that does uh, specific like children driven awards um, so I already mentioned that Moss won an award for best tech, tech toy and the Ozbot won best Rosebot the best robot. Um, Osmo won for innovation and best app was Lumi Kids Park and there's a Maker Maker uh, subscription service. So Osmo you can use uh, textile play with digital uh, readout. So you can it blends physical and digital together so there's all these different learning exercises that you can do um, to strengthen your knowledge. Lumi Kids Park uh, I guess the best way to explain it was like Farmville, but with science and physics involved. So you can you would build your your park, um, but you have to keep in mind like the physics and math with it. It's a really neat app. And one of my favorite things, so a company called Creator Box, and I think it was like 15 bucks a month, will send you a kit, and you would build it. So it's like a um, subscription service for makers. So you can build something new every month, and they just send it to you, uh, and all the pieces you need. So I think I went through things pretty fast. So if there's questions, you want to talk about CES in general, uh, I'll open the floor.
All right. Thanks, Brian. I uh, just want to remind everybody that uh, we will happily take questions through the Q&A, or if you have a microphone, just say so, and we'll happily listen to your dulcet tones uh, in, when you ask your question. Uh, Brian, I got a, a couple of questions for you. Um, what did what was there any sort of uh, ebook or e-reader presence at CES this year? Um, that you saw? <laughs> no, not not really. Not that I didn't see. Uh, there was there was yeah there wasn't anything new in terms of tablets or readers or anything like that 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 stood out for me. Um, there was a, a display of people selling books though, which is pretty cool. <laughs> e-books or physical books? Physical books. Really? Okay. <laughs> Um, it, somebody, uh, the one comment did come through from the audience uh, early on is when you were talking about the, um, the, the, the wearables and the, the sensors and all that, which was... Because I had the same kind of, about when the, um, you think they can measure how much is in your jars and containers to figure out what, how much you need for a recipe? Yeah. Audience? Yeah. The comment was, these things also make for a lazy society. <laughs> Which I had a similar thought. That's like, true. Really, you, you can't look in your jar and see. Oh yeah, I need to buy more flour. Well, I think the idea yeah. is, if you're like at the grocery store, um, they even have fridges that talk to you too now. So if you're like at the grocery store and you're like, hmm, what do I want to eat tonight? You can text your fridge like, what can I have for dinner? It'll look at everything you have in there and then give you back. Here's what we can make. Uh, well, here's what we can make if you buy this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. Ah, the smart fridge. Eventually it will actually happen. Um, well, I, and, and it kind of led me to a thought around maybe more towards the sensors, especially when you got to the, like, the baby things. and the. I mean, I wear a Fitbit, don't get me wrong, but were any of these companies talking about or did you ask them about kind of privacy and security issues with, with this data and how it's being transferred and what, what's being done with it? I think from, from personal knowledge, um, and also what kind of my fear. So they all say, like, hey, don't worry, we keep the data and we own the data um, and we won't share it with anyone. But if I was a healthcare company, and this is where my fear comes in, if I was a healthcare company with a ton of money, wouldn't I just go buy Fitbit? And now, now I know um, all those users, if, if I insure them, if I know they're healthy or not. Like there's really nothing stopping me. If I buy the company, so now the data has to be mine. Um, but I think from what I understand, there's, there's, some, there's some companies that actually, or some healthcare companies that say, hey, if you share your data with us, like Fitbit-wise, we will actually give you, it's more of a discount thing. So, hey, look, it looks like you're being really active and really fit. Here's a discount um, versus being negatively rewarded for poor, healthy habits. Mm -hmm. Okay. But at least that, that's kind of what I've heard. I, I didn't ask anyone any of those, those types of questions. Okay. Well, you know, I, I, I actually, to be honest, I think I would be personally surprised if they were actively talking about those issues at the, at the sales booth. <laughs> but, you know, you never know. It's, it's, it's that. So some of these you may have already mentioned, but I, I kind of like to do this. And, and even if you didn't mention them, maybe even better. What would you say was like the completely wackiest, silliest, I don't believe this exists thing you saw? Um. The, the the screen because I thought it was staged at first, um, but they had like this pre-recorded thing put together. Let me find it. Uh, the Panasonic booth. Where um, the one the one lady sitting down was able to oh uh -huh. put things on her face, and um, and the and the real time like as she moved like mm. as if like she actually had a beard and mustache. I did a double take at first. I was like, wow, there's somebody with a beard and a mustache. And then I looked at her, I'm like, no, she doesn't. And I looked back at the mirror, and I was like, oh, that's unique. Um, yeah, I don't know. And I, from a business case, I don't know if there's any an actual need for something like that. But I guess if you're like, what do I look like with blue hair? You don't have to dye your, dye your hair anymore to find out. You can just sit in front of your mirror and click on well, and I'm, I'm almost thinking with this one, extending it out to um, you know, uh, virtual uh, trying on clothes, you know, if you get it a little bigger than just the face. Bigger screen, no, that's true. Yeah. But, you know. And then have that in, like, um, uh, retail. Yeah. So, hey, what do I look like with that outfit without actually trying it right. out? Um, what, what items surpri kind of surprised you the most? And, and I'll, I'll leave your definition of surprise to you. Um, 
So last year, last year I ran into these guys, um, and like the technology wasn't there yet. They didn't really have anything developed for it, and um, and like they had like a card table size booth. This year they had it all mounted with all their computers and like different things you can do. Um, and so the line wasn't bad for this. So I was able to try it, and so last year I had a headache trying to like tell myself to do it. This year, whatever they did differently, or maybe it's me. Like as I looked, the mouse moved, and like that, and it just was fluid. Um, but in terms, and then in terms of like, why is this here? Uh, the mattresses was a little weird. Like they had all the brand ambassadors laying in bed selling or showing off mattresses. I guess and I was like, that's not really techy. I guess the mattress moves. Um, at first, I thought they were one of the mattresses that sense like how you sleep and if you're sleeping correctly. Uh -huh. Um, but the one guy's like, no, this this levitates, and if you're snoring, you tap this button and it fixes it. I was like, okay. No, uh, I, I I think my wife wants one of those. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, All right, you want me to give you the list? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, I, and and let's let's say like just the single coolest thing you saw. Like, I really want to take one of those home with me. Hmm. Um, I did say that quadcopters isn't really my thing, but I've always wanted one. Um, just to say I have. Uh, the coolest thing that I have to have is the, that that fully immersive game station. Yeah. Um, how, how, like I just thought, like I, when I was a kid, I was like, oh, because it was in all the movies. Like you hop on this like virtual reality set uh -huh. and you're fully immersed and you can run around and duck, shoot, and cover. And I'm like, that'll be cool. Yeah. And then I kind of forgot about it until I went to see yes, and I was like, oh, childhood dream is finally possible. Yeah. Can Can you? Talk a little bit more about that. Chris and I kind of looked at each other and went, $500? I, like, like, how does it act? What does it connect to? How does it actually work? Can you? Yeah, so, um, so the way it works, so you'll need a game, a game system that would work with an Oculus Rift. Uh, oh, okay. So I, I, okay, I got it. Yeah. And so you, you wear the Oculus, so the Oculus Rift is a lot, like 200 bucks. So it's a $700 game system, if you will. You wear, you have to, it comes with shoes. And the shoes can detect like which way you're facing and how you're running. And the the way this it's a rubber mat at the bottom that's concave, so you can like run in place without having to like run in place. I don't know if okay. that makes sense. Like you'll run, and since it's concave, you're actually running. Right. Okay. Yeah. The, the Oculus Rift makes sense. You're not you're not hooking this to your Xbox, your PlayStation. You're 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 working right. you're working with a uh, a head head mounted display. Right. Okay. That makes okay. I get it now. Still five hundred bucks. Not not bad, really. That's comes uh, with the harness, the stand thing, and shoes. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> so uh, I just got to see if pulling the trigger for five hundred dollars or something, and they only use once or twice, just because I've always wanted it. Uh -huh. uh, it's worth it. Okay. Um, and it looks like we have a question from the audience. Yeah, we have a comment leading into a question thing here. Um, it says early adopters, notwithstanding, it seems like a number of these products might be for businesses to offer a new service to customers. And yet, there's the whole market, and wearables certainly is aimed at the individual. For the products aimed at individuals, will the prices deter all but the most die-hard early adopters? Kind of pricing um, some of these more individual type things. Yeah, kind of piggybacking the, the 3D printer thing I pointed out. Mm -hmm. I think the way we're moving, um, we're able to do stuff for cheaper now. Um, and at the same time, like somebody will come up with a product that it's super expensive because they literally had to do it by hand, essentially, um, and they didn't have manufacturing in place, uh, and they didn't have a, you know X, Y, and Z lined up. It was a time-consuming process. As we move forward, um, somebody else will go, hey, you know what? I can make that, but better and cheaper. And I think this competitive market that all of a sudden has exploded. Um, when you think about it, five years ago, you didn't really hear too many people talking about startups. Or you didn't hear too many people talking about entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. uh, but now, like, if you don't hear it, like, for a whole week, no one mentioning it, something's wrong. You like notice it. Uh, so to answer the question, I think yeah, a lot of the wearables we see, this this Omni package that that's on the screen now, I'm sure within another year, someone else is going to develop it for cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, and so, my whole thing is from a cost perspective now, like, don't if, if it's hot. Don't buy it right away. Uh, for instance, the Google Glass. Um, I know some people are fans of it. I personally wasn't because 1500 bucks is really expensive. 
Uh, but now there's companies that are doing wearables. Sony actually displayed one of their, wear, their wearable glasses with a screen on it. And I think it was for like a couple hundred bucks. Um, so there's companies now that make very similar to Google Glass, but it's under a thousand. And so you ask yourself, you know, do I want to be a diehard fan or do I want to use it? So then I'll just wait a little bit. Same with home automation because it's no one has perfected it yet. There's a lot of glitches and a lot of issues. Um, so I say kind of just hold out. Yeah, and that's kind of like one of the standard rules is unless you are, as this person said, an early adopter and are willing to be someone who is wants to test the product and go and realize it's going to have bugs, never buy the first version of anything. <laughs> that's like a standard rule for the average person. Just don't. You can watch, see this stuff, see some, oh, that's cool. Wait a couple of years, and then it will actually be ready for prime time for the normal person. Both yes, in performance and in price. Right. All right. Uh, nothing else from the uh, audience? All right. Brian, I, thank you very much. In fact, one of those wearables is going to – I've got three pieces of news I want to talk about, and, and a new wearable coming out is going to be one of those. So, uh, Brian, thank you so much. I am, I am jealous. One of these years I will get back to CES to just, to, you know, just geek out for a solid week. Um, so, Brian, uh, you think you're getting back to your, your, your contact info there. We had that up. Um, we will be getting uh, Brian's slides from him, and Crystal will be going through and finding links to as much of this as she can. So we will uh, make sure to get all of that into the show notes uh, this afternoon or tomorrow. Usually we can do it within 24 hours. Uh, so, uh, Brian, thanks once again. I'm going to take back control for just a few minutes here and uh, share a couple of news items that I would like to show folks. So give us just a sec here to do that. Uh, and so, okay, so I've got uh, three things that I want to share with you here. And this first one, um, the title's bad. Please ignore that title. I will fix the title when I get uh, uh, back to my uh, office uh, after lunch. But uh, this first one is there is a new uh, Facebook app for your phone. And I literally discovered this about 20 minutes before the show uh, called Facebook Lite. Uh, it is an official app from Facebook. However, it's not available in the United States through the Google Play Store, uh, but it, you can get it from this, and I have installed it, so I will, I will back this one up as, as a good site to get it from. But it gives you all the features of Facebook, but it uses more of the web interface, and it actually supports the messaging in the app. So it's a little more bandwidth friendly, um, and you don't have to install a separate Facebook app and a Facebook messaging app on your phone. So if that is something that is an issue for you, you might want to check out the Facebook Lite app. Um, Windows 10 release and pricing has uh, been announced this past week. Uh, it is not an actual date hasn't been specified, but they are saying that Windows 10 will come out this fall. <clears throat> um, more importantly is the pricing. The way that the pricing will be set up is if you are a user of Windows 7, 8, or 8.1, you will be up, able to upgrade to Windows 10 for free as long as you upgrade within the first year of its release. After that, you will have to pay for it. Okay. Now, Windows is no, some people have misinterpreted this to say you get a free upgrade for a year, meaning like it's a subscription. It is not. You get a free upgrade as long as you upgrade within 365 days. And there is no of expectation release yeah, of release date. There's no expectation that then there will be like an annual fee or anything like that. Some people have misinterpreted this. So the recommendation is going to be when Windows 10 comes out, you've got a year to get it for free as long as you're on Windows 7 or higher. So yay, uh, everybody who's been waiting for Windows 10. I, well, Brian I, just yes. kind of said, so forcing me to be an early adopter. Well, <laughs> well, actually, you can upgrade to it now if you want to, but it's still on the beta stage. So as Krista was mentioning earlier, if you're not willing to play with bugs, mm -hmm. do not you know, if you've got a spare machine or you want to run in a virtual machine like I talked about a few months ago, on Tech Talk, you can do that. Um, it's pretty slick. I was a fan of 8. 10 is great. I'm, I'm loving it so far. Um, and at the same time, Microsoft is going to put out their wearable called HoloLens. This is going to be a head-mounted display. Was this at CES? This was not at CES. They just announced it last week at one of their meetings. So, so Brian didn't see this at CES. Um, this is a, a head-mounted display. Uh, is, so it does kind of go around your head. And let me see if I can find a better picture here. And it kind of looks like, 
I'm gonna, for lack of a better term, those kind of like old people sunglasses, the sunglasses you put over your glasses, the, the really big ones. And the way it works, unlike Google Glass, where you are actually looking at something on a screen in front of your eye, this is more augmented reality in that it overlays things on your environment that you're looking at. And if you are a gamer, and what a lot of people were talking about was there was an actual demo of Minecraft using this thing. Ooh. And you got to build in 3D in Minecraft using, like, he's building on his table and on his sofa there. And if you look over the fireplace here, you could actually look through that into another room. Now, there's been no pricing on this yet. I've listened to a lot of people who are actually at this Microsoft presentation and got to use it. And almost every single one of them said, I was ready to think this was overhyped and was going to suck. And every single one of them went, I was actually very impressed with this technology. They've actually kind of pulled it off. Now, again, don't know the pricing. If it's a couple grand, you know, it, it's, it's going to take a while uh, for, to get people on. If it's under a grand, I might save my pennies. I don't know. This is, this is looking pretty impressive uh, with that. One of the other examples they were giving uh, kind of, you know, here's your Netflix on the wall that you're just happen to be looking at. Um, here is getting uh, directions and building 3D models in space in front of you. Just watch the video, take a look at this. It's called HoloLens. It's it's pretty impressive. Uh, even I thinking it's it, like you know, Google Glass. I wasn't going to spend the money. This I might try to find the money. So uh, those are the three newest items I have. Uh, for us this week, and I think with that, we will call it an end to the tech test, or tech test, mm -hmm. the tech talk, and I will hand it back to Kristen. Yeah. So if anybody, nobody has any last minute questions, looks like nothing came in desperately there at the end. Okay. That's great. Um, yeah, we'll wrap it up for this week's Encompass Live. It has been and is being recorded. Um, as we said, Brian will be sending us his slides, um, so we'll have them available for you in all the links for any of the companies and products and things that he uh, mentioned will be included afterwards. Um, we Our recordings go up on our website. Here is the Encompass Live website here. Our archive sessions link is right here at the bottom. And when you go over there, you'll get, um, let's see, do we have everything here? Yeah. Our recording is on YouTube. We post presentations up on the SlideShare or wherever they are and links to our delicious account. Everything will be linked there for you all in one place when this is all said and done. So that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, I hope you join us next week when um, we'll be doing strategic planning. Um, <laughs> depending on your point of view, that's great or not so great. Um, it's a, well, strategic planning in general is a good thing. Um, here in Nebraska, we have new, um, new as in last year new, I believe, mm -hmm. um, guidelines for public library accreditation, which now require strategic plan being done. Uh, Richard Miller is our uh, director of library development. Um, yeah, library Lord development God. here, <laughs> and um, he's been going around the state doing some trainings on this, and he's going to come on the show now and do a uh, strategic planning in a nutshell for people. So if you're interested in what to do for strategic plan at your library, definitely join us for that next week. And for any of our other upcoming shows we have over the next few months, they are posted here. Um, also, if you are a Facebook user, and Compass Live is also on Facebook, we post when our um, recordings are available, when new shows are coming. Here you can see I posted a reminder for this morning's show, letting people know they could log in for it. So if you are big on Facebook, please do go ahead and like us there, and you'll be notified of when things are happening. Other than that, I think we are good. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye. Bye.